Alos, a two to four player game from designers Guido Eckhoff and Avadi Fuller and publisher Spielas, is a simple game. Even the rules say so. Alos is a simple game. The rules are straightforward and old school German style where all the actions are clearly delineated, the interaction occurs as you're fighting over resources and spaces, and you are trying to score the most points, primarily by occupying harbors with your ships. Players collectively determine the winds that blow ships across the board, and you have to take charge of those winds as best you can in order to score in the limited number of turns available. Here's how it works. Here's the game board set up for four players, with each player having their own player board that starts with three settlements on it, two ships, and a number of win tokens based on their position in player order. Each player has three additional ships that are set aside in a reserve that they can acquire over the course of play. Action takes place in these seven harbors and rivers that lead to temples. Each player starts with a hand of three cards. Cards come in two colors, gray and purple, and they are numbered zero to five. On a turn, you must play one card onto the proper colored pile. So I could put this three on here. If the symbols match, and there are three types of symbols, sun, cloud, and water, then I gain a wind token as a bonus. So if I do this, no bonus. If I do this, I get a bonus. It's a small reward that happens, well, it, it pushes you to play in certain directions sometimes to match to get this bonus because with wind tokens, among other things, you can adjust the total of the topmost numbers. That total determines where you will take an action or where you will send a ship. So the total is seven, I can spend a win to make the total six or eight, or I can spend two win to make it five or nine, or three win to make it four or 10. When you take an action, if you don't have a settlement or ship on that space, you must move a ship there in order to take that action. So if I take a seven action, I take a ship off my board, I put it here and I gain four points. Very straightforward action. If the total were six, I would get a Favor of the Gods card, which has a random action on the back. You start with one of these cards at random at the beginning of play. Talk about what they are later once other things are explained. If you take a five action, you get a green gem or take a ship from the reserve and put it on your board. The gems give you an end game scoring bonus based on the number of different colors you have, and you can collect more than one set of gems. Go here, you get a red gem, or you put a settlement where you have a ship on the board and where you don't have a settlement and where there is space available. So if this were my first turn and I had a sum of four, I could place a settlement only here because this is the only place that I have a ship. Having more ships gives you more opportunities for settlements, but once you have a settlement, I no longer need a ship there in order to take that action in the future should I have a four. There is another bonus for a settlement. When you place a settlement on the board, that turn, instead of drawing one card at the end of your turn, you draw two. You'll have a permanently increased hand size, which gives you more options for what to play. We'll skip the three action for now. The eight action, you get a yellow gem or three wind tokens, your choice. Over here, you can spend two wind tokens to advance your profit to a level and eventually land in the temple. When you go to a level, if you're the first one here, you get two points. If you're the second, you get one point. Whenever you go to this spot, regardless of whether you're first or fourth, you get this bonus, which is two points per ship that you have in play. So anywhere other than reserve. So I get four points right now. Ideally, I might wanna bring in more ships and then hit this spot to get more points. If I go here, I get three points per settlement that's in play. So again, maybe I wanna put those on the board first. Here, I get two points per wind that I have in my reserve. You can have at most five wind at the end of your turn, and it costs two wind in order to move a profit. Hmm, seems like the most you can get is six points, but there are ways to override that. If you get down to the end, you occupy a space with your profit, you gain the purple gem, the only way to get that fifth color of gem, and you score points. So 
go to the highest pointed spot first, and then that sp space is occupied and off limits for the rest of the game. The three spot. Well, before I get to the three spots, let me go back and say how if this were seven and I spent three wins, I could go to 10. Now there is no harbor that is 10, but there are river spaces that are 10. And you can put a ship directly onto a river space. So if I did this, I paid three wind, I go to a 10. Great, I'm sailing my ship now towards this temple. And I could be on any river, sailing towards any spot here. If I go to the three harbor with, my, with another ship, not this one, because this one is on the river, I can get a blue gem or spend up the three wind to move ships. If I spend three wind, I have three ship movement points and I can move one ship three spaces or one ship two and another one or however I want to divide it. So if I go here later, I spend two wind, I can move my ship one, two spaces, go in a harbor, get that gem, get those points. Or if I go down here, get lots of points, 20 points, or 18 or 15, depending on whether it's occupied or not, or 11 points and a non-purple gem. Get points, get four points, and two favor the god cards. Get points, or points and four wind. Every space can be occupied only once. Once you put a ship there, it is out of play for the rest of the game, which is why you need more ships. If you dock both of your ships, you do nothing the rest of the game except play cards, and take no actions unless you have settlements in particular spots. So don't do that. So that's the nature of the game. Play a card, move a ship to that spot. There's no limit to where you can move. If you have a ship in the river and no other ships are available, I can play a card and just yoink this ship off the river to do something else. Except now I've lost my movement. Why did I waste my time going there? Poor move, Eric. You can spin wind to move a ship from the harbor onto the river, but from here you can't move at all. Here you're at the mouth of the river, spin wind, go on. The only way to reach a temple to get to that final spot is to take this action. So I can spend wind to have a total of 11, put me right on the edge here, but then I need this action to make that final push. And this is a primary tension because all of the players collectively determine what the wind is. Each turn you are playing only one card. So at most I could swing this down to a four and then I would have to spend wind to get it down to a three. In this situation, if I were trying to go high, I can go to five and I need to spend more win to get a six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, whatever it is. So there's a limit of how far you can swing things over time. You have this movement towards high numbers to put ships in the harbor to move onto the river and a push towards low numbers in order to make that final push into the temple. Now, one way to get around that win system is to make use of favor of the god cards. Once you have them in hand, you can start planning for how best to use them. This, for example, gives you three wind and one point. So if I were moving a profit down to this space, I could play this card, add more wind here to bump up my bonus. I can go over the five wind threshold at that time just for that moment to maximize that. I can spin the wind to move a profit one space. I don't need a ship there. I just spin the wind and do that. I can spin the wind to take any harbor action. There's all the anchors at the harbors. I can get five points or place a ship anywhere on a spot nine or less. At the end of the game, each card that you do not use is worth three points. So if you don't think you're going to get a ship, get five points. You can spend these cards at any time on your turn. You can spend as many as you want. Here, take a non-purple gem, assuming they are available. They are limited. 
based on the number of players in the game. These are the number of players, number of players plus one. This is always three. You can spend a win to get two ship movements. So if I have ships right on the edge, I don't need a three action. I can use this to spend the win, get two movement, boom, boom. Give five points or place the settlement anywhere that I want. Even if all the spots are occupied, you just get to place the settlement next door. Here, adjust the sum one to four points up or down. There you go. Those are the variety of favorite cards available. You can plan around what you have in order to get around the limits of the win sometimes, or to take bonus actions to chain things together. You can play a card to move a profit and then play the card to adjust here, get nine, assuming I had a ship available, put it in nine and now move my profit again. So you can take multiple actions that way. You also have two bonus tokens that are worth points at the end of the game if you don't spend them, but you can spend them if you want for the action. Here, you draw five cards, add them to your hand, and then discard five cards, shuffling them back into the deck. So that gives you immediate choices. If you are desperately looking for something, as I have done in games, spend it. See whether you can draw the thing you need to make the total what you want, possibly to match something, to get a bonus win, because you need that win desperately to do something in particular. With this action, you can take a harbor action of your choice. You give up those four points to take something. And primarily, this has been used at the end of the game in order to take a three action, to spend win, to push ships into those harbors, into those final docking spaces in order to get points. The game lasts a number of turns based on uh, the players. With two players, you're going to remove some cards from the deck. They're indicated with symbols, and then you play through the deck once. With three players, you put some of those cards back. You play through one and a half times. So when you finish the first time and you have piles here, you take all the cards underneath the top ones, shuffle them together, just take half at random, boom, and the other half is out of the game. Play through that. With four players, you play through the deck twice. There you go. After that time, you are going to see who has the most points. You have end game points. You have all the points that you scored during the game by playing cards, by going to the seven spot, by using your profit, and by landing in these temple spots. At the end of the game, as I mentioned, three points per favor of the gods card, one point per leftover win, and points based on the gems that you collect. The first gem is only worth three points. If you have a set of two different color, that's seven. So the first one is worth three points. This is worth four for the second one. The next one is worth five. So you get 12 points total. And then 18 and 25. So 25 points if you get a set of all five. It takes a little work, but it's more valuable collectively if you can put that all together. See who has the most points at that time and wins. I played yellows five times on a copy purchased at Spiel 22, once each with two and four players and three times with three players. And as advertised, it is a simple game. It's easy to teach the rules to people and for them to jump into play, mostly because the goal of the game is obvious. You're getting points, okay, and there's gems laid out and there's temples to get to. Everything is laid out in front of you. You know what you wanna do, get to temples and collect gems. But how? You're going to have a hand of cards and it's not always clear what the best course of action is or what the payoff is over time. What, what's the value of getting a favor of the gods card or building a settlement or collecting three win tokens or four points? I know it's four points, but what is the value of that really? I broke down the deck a bit, something I don't normally do, but I was really curious with this game. You count all the cards and you see that in a two and three player game, you will have at most 18 turns. And in a four player game, you'll have at most 20 turns based on the size of the deck and the number of times you go through it. But as people build settlements, their hand size increases. So that's a card taken out of play, which means you will have fewer turns available. 
the end of the game trigger is when someone cannot draw a card from the deck, you complete the round, and then the game is over. And it's not a mystery. You can see how many cards are left in the deck, so you can calculate out how many turns you have available for the things that you want to do. And winning scores in our games have generally been between 80 and 90. So if you're taking 20 actions and the winning score is 80 to 90, the highest we ever saw, I think was 95. Well, then an action should ideally get you a little more than four points. So the seven Harbor that gives you four points straight up is not ideal. It's good, but it's probably not going to win you the game. Ideally, you want to get more than that four points per action. And of course, you're probably taking fewer than 20 actions. In a two and three player game, you will definitely take fewer than 20 actions. And then depending on the number of settlements, even fewer. So how, do, how are you gonna maximize that? But what's the value of building a ship? There is no value initially. It's nothing except that you're going to abandon ships at temples and then they're out of play. So you need a replacement ship in order to take other actions. Hmm, what's the value of getting wind? Well, wind lets you adjust what you're actually doing in order to achieve certain things. So you need it, but how much do you need it? And what's the value of it? It's not necessarily clear, at least from my five games, I've not assessed and tracked every single action that I've done and seen how efficient everything has been. But things are fairly open in terms of what you're doing. You can take an action when you play a card and put a ship directly onto a river. So you're getting towards a temple, but you take no action with that ship. Is that bad? Is it giving it up? Is it just the halfway step and then you take another action in order to get it to the temple? And so maybe that's two actions, except maybe more because you probably played win. You had to spend other win to take a three action or to use a favor of the gods card. You to, like you can break down sort of the cost of everything, but it's still somewhat abstracted and still sort of mushed together in a nice way that you can't strictly delineate this action gave me this many points and therefore I should do that. That's the ideal action. Until you get to the end of the game when you have one or two turns remaining and you look at your options and you're just like, oh, well, I do whatever ends up with the, the most. The end game sometimes slows up a bit as people are trying to do those calculations on exactly what's left. It depends on how you have set yourself up in earlier turns. I had one game in particular where I set myself up nicely, uh, where I had three ships on the final space of a river and I had my bonus action and enough wind, I could take a harbor action. Uh, that would give me win to move ships into the harbor. I had to be able to play a card to get the third wind in order to push all three of them over, but it was set up perfectly in case, you know, I could get that last wind. Sometimes with experience, I think you can play that way and set yourself up for future turns and plan a bit more. You're not relying strictly on the wind. It's a really interesting feel of the game because when I first explained it to this one player, they said, ah, this could be any theme. It doesn't matter what it is because really it could be any theme. I'm placing something somewhere and I take an action, I collect these things and it could just be an extremely abstract board, components, everything. But as you're playing, you do actually feel the, the concept, the idea of you collectively riding the winds based on, as I explained earlier, the total amount of the card decks rising and falling and giving you opportunities for going particular places. So you have a bit of group think based on what everyone is doing. I'm starting to go high, I'm getting, I'm doing the eight harbor and getting win tokens, preparing for something else. And I hope it stays high at my next turn and then I can play someone down the river and spend wind and push them really farther down. So. You're collectively making choices that are driving where people go. And at a certain point, you want to dip low and so, so you can hit that three spot and then make that final push off the river if you don't happen to have the favor of the gods card that lets you do that. 
But of course, if you do that, then other people can do that at the same time. So are they also trying to do it? Are you working together maybe with someone else and collectively you can sort of push it down and take advantage of that? So there's this interesting interplay between people as the winds rise and fall. And you can imagine them pushing you one way or another across the board as that happens. You're competing for the gems because there's a limited number available. There's only three purple, no matter the player count. In a two-player game, there's only two blue, two yellow, three each, red and green. And so you can snatch those early depending on what cards you have and what cards they don't. And maybe you just take all the yellow. They take all the blue. They can't complete those large sets, which lessens the value of other things for them. So you can sort of push someone in a particular direction based on what you were doing. You're taking this high temple spot. You're pushing your way down the river. You're trying to dominate uh, the purple gems so that other people can't get large sets. There's little ways to do that in sometimes an obvious way because you're taking the only spot available in a temple and sometimes it's more the threat of what you're doing as you're pushing ships down the river or positioning them certain ways. So it's interesting interaction Again, based on the sort of German style play where we're all in this shared space and we're doing these things together and collectively influencing one another. Again, mostly through the wind and how we're shifting around. The one thing that has troubled me so far over five plays is that settlements don't seem as valuable as they initially appear. Typically when I've been teaching the game, first time someone plays, they want to build all their settlements because it's a thing on your board. It's an action you can take, and it seems like a thing that would be good to do because you've got a potential profit bonus if you get the profit down to that level. You can take actions without needing to have a ship somewhere, so you possibly don't need to get as many ships, and you have a larger hand size, which gives you more options for what you can play. And yet, I have won a number of times without putting a settlement on the board and just going with the best in my opinion, best option of the three cards I have in hand and making it work. And I'm not sure if the value of the settlements is there or I just haven't seen it yet or it's is it a false path that people go down that doesn't really pay off or have they just not figured out how to do it well because that's typically the actions that someone does in their first game when they don't know the rest of the game and they're not doing things efficiently. And... I've started games four and five saying, well, I'm going to build settlements this time just to see if I can make this work. And then I never build a settlement because the cards that I have work for other things. And I just start down this path and then I end up getting all these temple points and that works out better. And I just never get back to the settlement. It, it seems like you don't necessarily want one settlement because what does that do for me necessarily? but you want all the settlements because then you get the profit points. But again, maybe I'm not thinking of this right. Maybe I just don't have enough experience yet to really know whether it matters or not. Don't know. I'm curious to play more. I like the game a lot. It's very much my style of play in terms of the simple rule sets and the interaction among players and how you just flow and definitely improve over time in terms of putting the actions together and having a a bit of planning for, I want to do this and do this, so I need win, I need high numbers, and how am I going to put all this together? And yet you're also relying on these tactical decisions at the moment to say, well, I could do this thing that I don't know the value of. I could get a favor of the God card that's a mystery. I don't know whether I can make this more valuable than something else that I could do. And it gives you a bit of direction, though, to have that favor of the God card in your hand because it's something you can plan for in the future and then really make work in a particular way. I did in one game, I got to the end and took a temple. Uh, the temple just points in two favor of the God cards, and both of them were the collect three win and a point. And so I'm like, okay, I will push my profit way down and get tons of win at that time and get a huge number of points and max out on the win and then be able to use that win later. So there's enough there to put together for a challenging, I want to say interactive puzzle, 
but it's a it's not a solitarish puzzle in the sort of modern Euro style, but more general German style puzzle of making the most at the current situation with some long-term planning that other people can mess you up on, but ideally you'll put it all together and the winds will put you in the right place. So there you go. A review of Yellows after five plays. Uh, happy I bought a copy and look forward to playing more.